this. And uh, I'll introduce our panelists in a moment. I just want to clear up some housekeeping items and, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll start the show. But uh, as always, we will uh, we'll be able to take questions. I'm going to hit bullet point number three first at any point. So uh, I think you'll see we'll, we'll have some fun conversations. So if you have some thoughts, some questions, some opinions, uh, just please submit them via the Q&A chat. And uh, I will uh, go through them and offer them up as I can. Uh, we will also do some at the end, and depending upon how things are flowing, we will have a, 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 a Zoom breakout room uh, at the ready. If uh, things are going well here, we'll stay here. If folks want to change the pace, we'll, we'll switch over there. So we'll make a decision later in this presentation. Uh, as always, this virtual event will be available after we're done. We'll put it up on devicetalks.com. It's available on demand. So if you have some colleagues who uh, were not able to attend and you want them to uh, to collect and gather some of this wisdom that will be shared soon, uh, please direct them to devicetalks.com. There are very there are actually no slides. I have all the slides. Uh, this is going to be a fun conversation. So uh, once I'm done and get to the agenda item, there'll be no slides, but uh, they are still available in the resource widget. And of course, if you are tweeting this, thank you, and use the hashtag, dev hashtag device talks Tuesdays. So real quick, device talks, as I hope you know by now, uh, we actually do put in-person events on, and uh, we'll be doing that, we hope, next year, October 4th and 5th in Boston, be at the Heinz Convention Center. So. Uh, Let's hope for uh, good things happen between now and then, and uh, we'll get together in a room again. But until then, this is a, a very cool substitute. It's been great to remain connected with everybody and to meet new folks like, uh, like these people from Sunrise and Boston Scientific. So here is our panel. We have Chuck, Joe, and Thomas Lopez. <laughs> Tom, I did call you Thomas. He said he, he goes by Tom, but we were going to... Uh, go Tom is Tom, but we'll go... We'll stick with just Toms. No Thomases today, unless Tom... Uh, objects, but uh, Chuck and Joe are with Sunrise, and, and I'll ask them their bios and their stories in, in a little bit. And Tom comes to us from uh, from Boston Scientific. He is speaking as an engineer, not necessarily as a representative from Boston Scientific. Not going to talk about the Boston Scientific way, but just create to uh, contribute to this sort of collaboration conversation. So this is a very simple agenda that uh, I've drawn up and uh, we'll follow along as best we can, but I think the uh, conversation will go where it goes. So I'm, I'm excited to start. Joe, why don't you uh, kick things off and just give us a little sense of, of who you are, what you are, and in their answer, I'm curious if you could let us know, was there a moment when you knew you wanted to be an engineer or were you just born this way? So I'm the exception to the rule. I'm the guy. I'm the program management, and I represent uh, the, the project or the business side of the development. Ah, okay. So th I'm in between these two. Uh, so that's more my role in this. You know, I, I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of creative people. I've been lucky enough to to, to work and get a few patents on my own and with a team. So. Uh, I appreciate the creativity that these these gentlemen bring. My own story is I've been in project management for, for I would say, 20 plus years, both in the medical device and diagnostic field. Uh, and again, working all size companies, big, small startup, uh, tier one. And the same thing keeps occurring over and over in the product development field. You have these great individuals with great ideas. My role is more how do I support that, marshal that uh, care and feeding of your engineer is really what, I, <laughs> what I'll talk about. And I hate to say this, in a lot of development rooms, somebody has to be the parent in the room. So uh, <laughs> that's more or less my, my role. So. <laughs> uh, Tom, your your team is in the World Series. So in honor of that, we'll, we'll follow baseball rules. You're, you're a visitor. You'll, you can go. Uh, you can go first. Uh, tell us a little bit about your story. How, you, how did you end up at Boston Scientific? Oh, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let's see, I am a mechanical engineer by training, and uh, I am a mechanical engineer with Boston Scientific in the R&D group. I have been with Boston for a little over 14 years now. I start losing track after a while. Prior to that, I actually was in a totally different industry. I worked in the swimming pool industry, focusing mainly oh. on control systems and for swimming pools. Prior to that, I was in aerospace for, for many years, uh, subcontractor to the primes, doing defense contracting, things like that. 
And so I, I've moved around a bit in my career. Um, I think that's actually worked to my benefit. Um, starting off in aerospace, doing high, high reliability type design, a lot of fiber optics and uh, high voltage. Then I moved into consumer products, which is of course swimming pools. And then when I was ready to move on to my next job, they were looking for somebody actually that could design both high reliability products, but also give it a consumer product feel. Huh. Um, there is something of a stigma, if you will, when you have wearable type of uh, medical devices and people don't want the stigma of looking like they have some sort of a condition. And so they wanted something that could look more like a consumer electronics and yet still had the reliability and the, all the documentation and quality standards that typically come with medical devices. And so I actually, I, something of a perfect fit for the role that they needed me to be. And that's pretty much how I got my foot in the door. And if I were to describe, really, I do a lot of mechanical design, but I also do a lot of what you might call project engineering, too, mm -hmm. um, having my hands and then all the aspects that really come together to making a product uh, come into reality. And that's a short, short version of what I do. So in aerospace, you were above ground. In swimming pools, you were below ground. And now in med tech, you're, you're right at ground level. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. You got it, you've got it all covered. Uh, did you have a moment when... <laughs> did you have a moment when you knew you uh, were you always an engineer, or or did you kind of grow oh, into that? Right. So you know, to think about that, um, I would have to go back to high school, I think, and applying to college and write my college essay why I wanted to be an engineer. At the time, I was actually playing a lot with Legos, even as a, a senior in high school. I would I would make. Uh, officially, I was making Legos for my younger sister to play with. Um, <laughs> but to be honest, I really enjoyed it. And I was thinking, to myself, I wish I could do this for the rest of my life, just play with Legos. And that was, just, that was the theme of my college essay. I still remember it all these years. I want to be an engineer so I could build better Legos. So I think it's uh, always with me. I, I, I couldn't really imagine myself doing anything else, creating, building. It's, it's just a part of who I am. I, I do it. In my off time, that's just who I am. That's great. I'll say I'll share that with my 11 year old son. He's a uh, Lego man as well. Chuck, how about uh, how about yourself? Uh, tell us a little bit about where you came from and, and how you became who you are. Okay. Um, so I've been doing uh, engineering for about 20 years, like uh, the other gentleman, and uh, I ended up teaching product development at UC Berkeley for a brief period without ever having developed a product. Which was, <laughs> was a very odd way to, to start off. Um, but I learned so much uh, uh, about the, that, the process that I got really intrigued. So I quit the lecturing job and went off and started developing products. Uh, I've done chemiluminescence and fluorescence imagers for laboratory biotech uh, applications, X-ray sensors and emitters, miniature analog controls, a brief stint designing software for calculating illumination patterns in greenhouses. And I recently um, finished up some blood plasma processing equipment which really pushed a, a, a lot of my own boundaries in terms of the different kinds of instrumentation and processes that I personally knew. Um, I think in terms of kind of my niche, something that I really enjoy is knowing just enough about the electrical engineering, just enough about the software, just enough about the marketing, manufacturing and industrial engineering that I can have really meaningful conversations with the, the people who kind of represent those interests. Uh, and, and it's the problems that can, the engineering problems that can get solved by different disciplines in different ways and that negotiation of who can do it the fastest, who can do it the best, who can do it the most affordably. I think that's the kind of problem that's always really uh, engaged me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think that like probably 80% of mechanical engineers, if asked that the question about that kind of moment of inspiration about what do you want to do? I'm going to also go with Legos, but I'm going to intersect it with Tinker Toys. When I uh -huh. realized that I could build little structures out of Legos that could attach to the Tinker Toys, I was able to, instead of building two small sets, I could combine them to create these 
much, much larger room spanning structures. That's awesome. That's great. And we had a comment from uh, James Lehman of Jazz, Jazz Pharmaceuticals. It says Legos are where it started for me too. So a lot of Lego, a lot of Lego fans in the audience. They're everywhere. <laughs> That's terrific. Uh, before we get into the, a little deeper into the talk, I, I'd love to just uh, hear about Sunrise Labs. Uh, you folks were kind enough to uh, to put this show on. So uh, just just quickly uh, tell us uh, who, who you work with. Most of your work is in medical devices, but what do you do, and what are some of the, who are some of the clients you can tell us that you're working with? I don't know, Joe. If you want to take that one on. I'm sure I'm willing, and I'm sure Chuck can uh, finish it off for me here. But uh, so we are a, a engineering services company in uh, Bedford, New Hampshire, outside Manchester, a beautiful part of the country, uh, great access into Boston. Uh, we do primarily medical device and diagnostic. Uh, we do everything from the software, firmware, all the way up to the cloud services. We do the hardware that sits in between it. Um, and we do uh, the housing that goes around the hardware that sits there. Uh, our, we have a, a great uh, cadre of people here and we all have a, see our common core belief of positive intent uh, where everybody is working to solve the issue uh, and everybody is on the same page and everybody uh, uh, means well. There's never bad thoughts or bad intention. Everybody is always trying to do, do the right thing and it, it creates an open and creative atmosphere um, and I think that that's critical on, on the innovation side. Um, it's, it's a positive uh, influence and a positive uh, aspect to your, your work life that carries through onto your, onto your personal life too, I find. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, I think the neat thing about us is we get to see a lot of different things. We know a lot of different solutions and we're willing to present and work uh, with a whole group of people across the world basically. Chuck can probably have more on that. Yeah, I was looking at your website, Chuck, and uh, trying to take down all the the different types of medical devices you worked on, and I and I gave up after a while because it's uh, <laughs> it's extensive. You're everywhere. I mean, robotics, respiratory diagnostics, breast imaging. Mm -hmm. So, what what are some of the uh, uh, talk a bit more about what are some of the areas that you're you're maybe focused most on, or perhaps areas we'd like to talk a little bit about today. All right. Well, I mean, I think the um, I'm going to briefly segue into we we have two kinds of two kinds of clients that we tend to work with. Um, one are top tier companies that uh, are resource limited and have funding for a project, but not internal resources. And so we will step in and you know bring a, a project to completion. Uh, another type, uh, uh, another client type of client we have is you know a little startup company has some seed funding. They have a working prototype, but they need help um, commercializing it, changing it so it can be made you know affordably, as well as you know, documenting all of the design controls that the FDA is going to want to see before they uh, allow the the release of the medical product. And we can bring all of that expertise. Uh, as well, uh, I think that you know you you didn't mention the dog collar. We we worked on a dog collar that will uh, have a moving invisible fence that will detect re the the dog's position relative to your phone uh, and uh, help keep your dog with you when you're traveling. Uh, and and I think that that the sheer variety of types of things that we work on from robotic surgery to imaging um, keeps everyone kind of on their toes. And if you don't like learning new stuff, Sunrise isn't where you work. Um, so we have a lot of very creative people there. And um, I think right now, my fav the favorite, probably the best product of my entire career is something that, that Joe ran for uh, one of our clients, Velico Medical out of, uh, Boston, or out of Massachusetts, Beverly, Massachusetts, I believe. And um, blood plasma goes in, dried blood plasma comes out. Uh, dried blood plasma uh, doesn't need the same kind of storage, doesn't spoil anywhere near as fast as the liquid stuff. Uh, and you add, and you uh, just add water, and you get functional plasma that can be given to anybody, and you know, allow them to to clot and recover from wounds. Uh, and it, it's going to wow. be saving. It's going to be saving tens of thousands of lives as as uh, as soon as it's uh, commercially released. I'm very excited about that. That's your favorite uh, your favorite project. I'm wondering, is it what was 
what did you like most about it? Was it the process of putting it together or the, or the good that it does? Oh, it's, it's definitely going to be the, the, the good that it does on the other end. Um, there mm -hmm. is one of uh, my supervisor at Sunrise. Uh, his mother was sick and he went to the hospital with her and not one but two different nurses came in with equipment that he himself had designed to use to treat and used it to treat his own mother and help her recover. Uh, wow. I just can't imagine. I mean, that that's kind of the, the I think, the be all end all goal for uh, any engineers working in the, the medical field is to, to be able to meet someone whose life was positively affected uh, or perhaps even saved because of, of something that you worked on. So that, that's, that's on my bucket list. Well, well, Tom Lopez, I mean, you've worked in a few other industries and uh, it kind of leads me to wonder, well, do you do you feel that difference working in the, the medical device area, working in, in neuromodscientific? It's, a, it's certainly an important area that helps a lot of people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, I think most people probably know Boston Scientific if they know anything about medical devices. So one of the larger manufacturers in the, in the world in this area. I actually work for one of the smaller divisions, though, the neuromodulation division, if you don't know what that is. Neuromodulation, or neuromod for short, is the stimulation of the nervous system to provide some sort of therapy, usually for the treatment of either chronic pain or deep brain stimulation for conditions like tremor or Parkinson's disease. And the indications that you can find a nerve and stimulate it are, are, are really quite large. So there's a lot of, a lot of diversity there for us to, to work on. And from working in the different industries that I had before and then coming to here, there's, there's a lot of personal satisfaction for sure to really see how our tech directly impacts people's lives for the better, to, to see them respond from going to a place of almost almost drug addiction with narcotics or opioids for their pain to being active living an act, active lifestyle again or being homebound because of you know their movement disorders being able to walk and talk and and be with their families again that's 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 so rewarding I, you know sometimes i'll get down on it about you know you're in the job you're in the trenches trying to meet a deadline mm -hmm. you know the job just maybe getting to you after a while, but then you see the stories, you get to meet the patients sometimes and, and see the direct impact on their lives. And it just, you know, kind of recharges you, really recharges your batteries, brings it all back, makes it real again, and, and just inspires me to, to, to keep doing that. And, to you know, when I think I'm going to give up on something, I got to remember, well, this could really be very meaningful for somebody to get it just right. So, you know, and get, just power through it and get it done. So that's, oh, that's great. Yeah. It is so important to, to, to remember that. Uh, and that's that's a, a great point. Now, to that point, I mean, it's still something that task we have to create. So let's talk. Let's move into sort of the the inspiration, the eureka moments of how you 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 collaborate and work together. One of the things I've always liked about my job writing and, and even doing some of this is I manage all the creativity myself. I come up with an idea for an article. I do all the work. I write it up and I send it along. And yes, it needs to be edited and, and other. But I don't have to, at the very beginning, collaborate with people to make it happen and to get it to where it, I think it needs to go. Uh, that just says something about me, I guess, how I operate. I'm, I'm in awe of people who can who can find ways to, to collaborate, uh, to, to create and collaborate together in that way. So, Joe, you're the, the parent in the room. Uh, yeah. How do you sort of foster that 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 uh, that atmosphere that allows for healthy collaboration between driven and innovative people. Yeah, like so, Tom. and that's a good point. You can have driven, but you, you're also looking for that innovative side. And the first thing you have really do to the team is lay out what, what the problem is. Uh, you know, what are we looking at? What are we trying to solve? Uh, some of the best ways to do that, um, you know, I've been lucky enough to be able to uh, uh, say live the life of, of a diabetic. So you would be uh, let the team member experience what the diabetic has to do. I have to test this many times a day. I have to uh, figure out how much insulin I'm going to put in and I can have this much food I'm going to eat at this time. Lay it out to them, you know, this is a problem situation. 
or uh, movement inhibited. You know, all right, you, you have a stroke, you can't use this side of your body, um, you know, and, and present that to them and, and simulate that. So the basic How far do you idea, take that? How, hmm? I'm sorry, how far, do you how far do you take that? Do you actually have people administer blood tests? Do you have them tie one, one arm by their side? Yeah, so uh, we're, I've done a number of projects within the, the diabetes uh, uh, world arena and continuous glucose monitoring. So you get permission, and yes, uh, all of us who've worked on blood glucose monitors will, will measure our own glucose. So yes, it would be one of those things. Uh, there are also uh, uh, medical groups that, uh, particularly in, in Minnesota, there's a group that uh, will set it up so you can experience what a diabetic goes through and set up a regime um, where you're actually administering saline, not insulin. So yes, uh, done that with two teams so they could really experience it. Had one one team that we actually kind of put ACE bandages on and simulated how we to get out of a chair, I can't move the arm. Um, that That's one way uh, of doing it. I've also, uh, believe in taking an observational look, you know, if you can get in an operating room or a simulated operating room, see the situation up, up in person. Um, so that's really understanding and, and presenting, uh, presenting the problem to the engineer is really the first step. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Chuck, is there, uh, is there an, is there room for a lone inventor uh, in no, a sort of it, a eureka moment? Can you do what it, I do in your business? <laughs> It's certainly satisfying, and it, and, it, and it does happen. There, there are moments where you know you solve a, a problem that seemed impossible, uh, you know, and you end up standing up and at your desk and, and screaming "woohoo" loud enough to scare your your next door neighbors. Um, and I think that 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 the the concept of you know like the lone engineer solving the problem by themselves. Uh, doesn't really happen very often, and and usually it, it needs to it, it needs to happen in a particular scenario where um, you know you have someone kind of pushing for the impossible ask. You know the 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 instance that comes to mind, I was asked at, at one point by a marketing guy who really had a good insight into what the the user needed um, to to place four slides, four microscope slides in a frame that was just fractions of a millimeter, fractions of a millimeter larger than the slides. And the slides needed to be positioned very accurately and held in place very accurately. And uh, two or three times I just told this guy, no, it can't be done. It's not gonna, it's not gonna fit. He kept, he explained the problem to me, made me understand the, the, the benefit, the reason he was asking for it. And I also had uh, a manager who was all uh, who was very supportive and said, "Okay, well, if we need to bring in a new manufacturing process, you know, just just let us know." And so, between being given access to new tools and and really having the problem described, I was able to come up with a, a solution um, that was very very satisfying. Um, but I think that. That's kind of the exception, not the rule, that kind of lone eureka moment. Mm -hmm. I think that a, a much more uh, uh, effective way of, of quickly finding solutions to seemingly intractable problems is getting together a group of individuals who have kind of overlapping specialties. They, they, like, so person A knows a little bit about what person B and C does, person B knows some stuff that A doesn't. So kind of everyone knows a little bit, but everyone also knows unique things. Um, mm -hmm. there, was, there was one instance where I had a, a pressure vessel that I was dealing with, and we discovered a failure mode that would result in a 4,000 pound force being applied to the door of the pressure vessel. So we would have to have built something that looks like a, a submarine door or a bank vault. And we did a series, someone asked for something that sounded impossible to me. They wanted a pressure reading in the middle of the stream. And I said, well, you can't do that. And then he said, but if I knew the pressure, I could then predict the failure mode. And then the other guy said, oh, but if I could predict the failure mode, how long in advance could I predict it? Well, three or four minutes in advance. 
well, if we knew three or four minutes in advance, we could shut down shut down everything in the system and it would be fine. So uh, we, we ended up running in this little circle, challenging and building off of each other. Uh, and we ended up, uh, when we could detect it four minutes ahead of time and shut everything down, we no longer needed the bank vault. Uh, because mm -hmm. the we would never get to that twenty four thousand, and without the bank vault, everything got smaller. And then, lo and behold, we can now take that pressure measurement. We could get the pressure sensor in there. So uh, it was that's the kind of thing where I think it, uh, that the creativity and the the team can really get traction. It, is you at you you kind of ask for the impossible, for, ask why do you want that, and then have the people around who can help you build a system that ends up backing you into the right solution. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Tom, uh, just going to you again as someone who's, who's in, been in aerospace and, and then in more of the consumer space, how, how does how do those experiences um, in, in designing products uh, uh, compare to what you're doing in med tech? And, and you mentioned you, you were brought in to sort of bring in that consumer experience to make med tech devices more... I guess uh, less less obvious. Um, what does that look like exactly? What what sort of what sort of elements do you bring in to to achieve that goal? Right. Well, the way I like to sometimes put it is that engineering is engineering, um, design is design, really. And I, to be honest, moving from industry to to industry, you know, the, the basic principles. Of, of engineering and design really don't change. You have materials, you have physics, that's always the same. It's more the environment that you're put into. Uh, you know, like in med tech, of course, it's a, it's a regulated environment. There's high, high risk, um, you know, you're dealing with patients and such. And that really is what drives your, your, you know, the way you focus on design. And a lot of the documentation, there's a lot more documentation for sure in the med tech industry and aerospace compared to uh, my consumer product experience. Um, but the basic, you know, elements of, of design, I think, are, are, are you know, universal and, and are portable. And so it's really just kind of learning business, learning the ropes, and uh, it helps having people, I think, of different experience levels from different industries bringing that diversity of knowledge and experience together that really creates the, the unique and interesting designs. I've, I don't think I've ever worked on a product which is really just purely mechanical, where I, the, the areas were, the, the, the discipline was purely mechanical and knowledge. There was always some, um, uh, you know, interdisciplinary uh, skills that you needed to do. So I always had to keep my electrical engineering skills up to snuff. Uh, even some of my firmware skills and programming skills, I had to keep up to snuff. But one of my favorite jokes was, you know, can we fix this mechanical issue with firmware? Sometimes you can. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if if I had any philosophy, I wish I had a philosophy or technique for innovation. You know, that I could just turn on and off. You know, like a switch. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't. If there's any common um, um, theme to, to my Eureka moments, I would have to say it's it's sleep. <laughs> getting good sleep. Getting it or not getting, getting it. it. Yeah, no, getting, <laughs> not, not getting good sleep. Because what hmm. I will do is I will spend a lot of time studying an issue um, or just studying technology, just learning what other people are doing and and what their issues are um, from different disciplines, just trying to pursue what I find interesting. I don't necessarily always have a problem in mind or a solution that I'm trying to find. I'm just trying to absorb all that I can. And somewhere it goes back into the subconscious and bubbles around there. I don't know what it's doing. But then fi I'll find, you know, after a good night's sleep, I'll wake up first thing in the morning with that aha moment, like, ah, Somehow, in the middle of the night, I've taken all these different puzzle pieces, and I found how they've all fit together. And that's when I think my most creative, some of my most creative ideas have come first thing in the morning, and then it's always exciting to go into work that day because I finally get to take this idea and, and and you know put it into put it onto paper, put it in the computer, and see what happens. Um, so, 
you know, if, if, if it's, it's that diversity, just experience and knowledge and, and just being mm-hmm. open to the new ideas and just be open to learning all the time, you know, finding out some new, something new and interesting. Cause you never know when it's going to show up, you know, and develop it. And one of the analogies we like to use is it's like having a book on the shelf, you know, and you kind of build this library of ideas on the shelf and you don't know when you're going to need them or if you're going to need them. But then when that moment comes, you say, ah, I can pull that down off the shelf and I can use that and pull that one. And, and, and that's really, I guess, kind of what it's like. It's building up that, that, that library of ideas out there. That's great. No, that's, uh, that, that's something we can follow up on where your Eureka moment come from or when you have them. I'm, I'm usually walking my dog when I have them. So maybe I'll, I'll get that dog collar from you, Chuck. But uh, we are getting some questions uh, from the audience, which is great. Thank you. Keep them coming. So Karen asks, uh, and Joe, maybe you can hand this, uh, handle this or, or hand it off to Chuck. But when the question is, when designing, do you, resi- do you rely on simulation tools? And could you mention your design process? Okay, so yes, we do use uh, simulation tools, but that we don't always rely on them for everything. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these tools will tell you one thing, but you have to actually make it in practicality sometimes uh, outweighs what the tool's telling you it'll do. Um, But we do definitely use a a number of simulation tools, um, you know, whether it be on our circuit side or or on the uh, solid model side, and Chuck can probably go into a little bit of, of more onto the tools. Um, and to the second part, um, I guess I, I would say in our design process, we follow, you know, pretty much a standard standard V model. You know, we were taking the uh, feasibility of the prototype and then moving on to uh, uh, a pilot build and then to production build. So it is a, a rather defined uh, uh, phase gate system that we use um, at Sunrise. But Chuck may want to talk a little bit about some of the tools because I know Lately, he's had good luck working with the electrical engineering group on, on a simulation tool that, that's gone a long way towards helping helping us out solve some problems. But Chuck, you may want to mention that. Chuck's on. Chuck, Chuck, you're on mute. Anytime. Uh, it's still on mute or am I live You're good again? now. You're, no, you're good. So, so I immediately ra- uh, wave a red flag around as soon as the word simulation comes up. Um, it's... <laughs> It, it's it's a powerful, often fast tool. It gets you very you know very compelling visuals, but um, it's it's a garbage in, garbage out scenario. Um, so uh, I always there, there's a few things I always make sure of. It's a, you, know, it, you always need to have someone. It, it always pays to have someone who has uh, a experience in whatever field to give you a. Um, a gut check. You know, there was one simulation I, I once saw where uh, you know, an engineer was present you know, was presenting his initial findings of some thermal analysis, and uh, and he was happily presenting that you know the temperature inside an X-ray machine was hotter than the surface of the sun. That he was happily showing the results. So um, you you need to really do a, a reality and order of magnitude check. And, and one of my, what I always really like to do is, is to simplify it to the the loosest, smallest, sim- most simplified model. If I have a mechanical structure, I'll find a way to approximate it as a diving board. Is I just I write down a little equation, this force, this deflection, and so I have that rough order of magnitude. And then I can go in and constrain it in 3D and and put all of the all of the loads. Um, so I, I always want to um, to start off with a closed form solution whenever possible. Help me uh, make it. It always helps to have a gut check as to what are the order of magnitudes that we should expect. And then mm-hmm. once you've done the analysis, um, you always want to. You, it, it always helps to close the loop. You get your prototype, so you you did the analysis, you did your design, you get the prototype, and uh, you want to do. You always want to do a test if you can to close the loop and, and verify that your assumptions were correct. Tom, any uh, any comments or thoughts on on simulators? Do you use them yourself? Simulations. Well, yeah, we do various simulations. Uh, most of my work I do in SolidWorks, and SolidWorks has some. Um, 
quick and dirty simulation tools um, built into it as a module that you can use. We also use more advanced um, simulation tools to do FEA, um, some computational fluid dynamics at times. Uh, but the, of course, the challenge, I think, just to echo what everyone says, is really validating the model. Um, your, your, your model's only as good as the validation on it. And sometimes the amount of effort that goes into validating your model, you might as well just go and do a test. Um, I'm not sure if the notified bodies, how keen they are in accepting simulation data these days, uh, you know, as, 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 as a design output or proof or verification of a design output. So oftentimes you have to do a test in the end anyway. So it, it certainly has its place. It gets you part of the way there. You know, but, you, but you're going to have to do your sanity checks. You're going to have to do your verifications. Um, actually, just last night, I was working with another engineer, and we we're trying to calculate the capacitance of something, and we were getting different numbers. And it turned out that when we con we were converting something from inches into metric, and the fourth or fifth digit in uh, uh, after the decimal point ended up changing our capacitance values quite a bit. And we were, we were, it took us a long time to figure out why are we both getting different values. And it wasn't until I actually sat there by hand doing every single calculation that I realized, wow, it's just that that you know one conversion factor on one dimension out to like the fourth or fifth place actually played a big difference. So it kind of gives you an idea of, you know, even something as simple as Excel can can cause you problems if you're not, if you don't know what you're doing. So um, you need that sanity check. Why is, why is it, you know, why is something not turning out the way we expect it to? So that's great. Uh, so actually there's one, one last little follow on thing that, oh, yeah, that sure, uh, uh, based that, that Tom reminded me of. So you set up your simulation, you do your, you know, and you, you end up with your numeric answer. It's like, these are my inputs, here's the answer. And you can say, yay, I have this number, it's within what I want. Um, uh, a really good follow through if you, if you, you really wanna nail everything down is to do uh, a sensitivity analysis to say that if I change my inputs this much, how much does that output change? Because uh, invariably, whenever we go to build a medical product, that you know, there will be subtle differences in every mechanical component and how everything gets put together. So, if it's something that's key to the performance and safety of a device, you know, having a single having a single analysis and a single result that says you're 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 good is not a not no. the best thing. Uh, you want to follow through to make sure that in addition to meeting the criteria, your design is robust and doesn't break with variations that will likely show up. That's great. We had a, a comment from Tammy saying she's seen physically impossible results come out of simulation two, and everyone at the table was buying in. Sometimes a common sense gut check is indispensable. So sounds like it's a, uh, it's a common feeling. Uh, mm -hmm. Another quite, we'll just go back to the queue because we are getting some good ones. Uh, James asks, has S a CFD modeling software evolved to more user-friendly and functionally relevant tool? Any thoughts on that from? I haven't, uh, unfortunately, I haven't used it directly as a tool. We actually have an in internal group um, where I reach out to them and they just, really kind of do the analysis for us and present us the results, which we then analyze. So I don't know if he's looking, when he says something like user-friendly, I, I really cannot speak to that. I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. So I'm, I'm going to say sure. no. I'm just going to shortcut and, and, and say no. It's, I think that the, the thermal tools and the uh, the thermal tools and the mechanical tools uh, are, are much easier. I think that when you get into CFD, um, things can, there's just so many more variables that pop up, kind of, you know, there's the densities, the temperatures, are chemical reactions occurring? Um, and and I, 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 my my recent experience has been that when you get a really serious CFD problem, you know, it, it's it's a CFD person is, is brought in to do it. It's, it's not something that, uh, that we would expect every mechanical engineer uh, at you know to have that. That's a good question. That, that, that'll that'll be interesting to see who finally makes that more doable. We we were talking a bit about tools uh, before we went live. Uh, tools that help you collaborate with uh, with each other. I think Chuck, you had talked about 
an element of Slack or something. What are you do, What are you working with at this time, particularly at a time, I guess, when we're not able to to work or haven't been able to work in the same offices? What are some tools that really help you do what you do uh, and keep doing what you do? I, I would um, say I, I think. One. Sorry, Chuck, go ahead. So uh, there was an absolutely ludicrous design review uh, that happened for a mechanical uh, assembly. Uh, right, you know, late in March when everyone was starting to go remotely. We had a very complex assembly. An engineer was presenting it on a Google meeting. And, you know, I would say, okay, well, no, we want, I want to zoom in on, on that 440 screw over there. And they would zoom in on a different 440 screw. And, and then I, and I'd have to back up. Or I would say, you know, if we reverse that flange, you know, and they would, they would sketch something on their screen and it was like well no not that way the other way it was incredibly frustrating and slack has has something that none of the other presentation tools have which is uh in a video call on slack the audience members can draw on the presenter's screen oh wow absolutely a game changer for the mechanical designer views is now you know, people can sketch and show me kind of what their solutions are right on top of the CAD model as I'm presenting it. Uh, and it, it, it's funny, it's such a, such a small thing, but um, it, it, it definitely made a, a giant step towards um, feeling like I was sitting around the table with physical parts in my hands. So that, that, that's my biggest record. And I'm pretty sure the, the free video call uh, with uh, comes with the the uh, non-member slack i think it's limited to like four or five people but i mm -hmm. i believe you can do the markup even on the unpaid version that, that joe is, is that what you yeah i was going to say and i i noticed that you know especially you're cognizant of time and and money and when these design reviews are running long you're like uh and people get frustrated but i did i did notice that right away and it's actually a, a tool you know for for a number of analysis going on, you know, when you're marking up documents and changing things, instead of like having somebody type in, you have multiple people working on the same thing. I think the good thing about Slack though, is the real time conversations that are occurring. You know, the channels that are created, we have the software engineer going back and forth with the electrical engineer, you know, about firmware, which IO pin should I be using? All that real time exchange that, you know, they would, look over the cubicle wall and ask somebody something, uh, but now they're doing it electronically. Uh, so th that's really st streamlined the process, um, you know, and, and increased what, you know, that Venn diagram that, that Chuck was talking about you need for an engineer. You, so you you have all the disciplines in there and you have your, your uh, systems engineer in a box when you have Slack there, you can all, all collaborate together. So that, that's been a great tool for us. So. Does it help alleviate? I imagine if you're working by yourself and working on a on a set project and you get kind of stuck or hit writer's block, if you want to call it that. Uh, how do you how do you break through that? How do you break through stalling creatively when you're working by yourself and there's nowhere to go get a cup of coffee and talk about yesterday's game or whatever might have previously broken your your ideas loose? I don't know, Chuck. If you or have thoughts on that, or Tom. Yeah, you know. It's uh, it's interesting, and uh, my my current boss, a guy by the name of Doug Brown, really kind of articulated this. If you want to see an engineer become miserable, you give them one giant Titanic project with with lots of tight with lots of difficult to solve problems that are specifically in their field, because uh, you'll you end up in the situation where you feel like you're just hitting your head against a wall. And uh, the, the term we've been using is a palate cleanser. If at all possible, have two projects, <laughs> and you have something, something you know, maybe it's improving, you know, the you know eternal, you know, internal document release process. Maybe it's you know developing, um, you know, taking some classes and learning learning a new tool. But you have something small that you know you can always make progress on. And then you have the big challenging thing that you know that you know the company is is earning its income with, and so when you hit that wall, you stop, you pivot, you spend a couple hours, you know, uh, and you you work on something, and you just kind of step away, step away from the problem. Um, I think that technique is it sounds simple, but uh, I think it's it's very very valuable. Uh, and and the other thing the other thing that really helps 
is to have you know more than one you know engineer of that specialty and you know sitting across from each other being able to communicate with each other to be able to bounce ideas off of you know to to give you some ideas avenues maybe you haven't explored and and to warn you about pitfalls uh, you know, if you're in a situation where you work at a small company and you know maybe you're the only electrical engineer maybe you're the only software guy um, I, I think that there's some really wonderful uh, online communities for you know helping you find a standard you know that applies to you know, mm -hmm. a particular device you're developing you know uh, you know help you uh, you know you, you describe it's this thing you saw it's this plastic with these things on it and the person's oh uh, oh it's an auto body panel clip you know it, it, that uh, I think that especially you know since I'm not sitting across you know across the the bench from from my coworkers I think that the online stuff uh, is, is a, a great way um, I think uh, I'm a big fan of uh, reddit.com slash r slash engineering uh, okay. Tom do you have a favorite do you have a favorite online engineering discussion group? Nope. No, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just talk to your, your Mookie Betts bobblehead doll. That's, yeah. that's the extent yeah, yeah. of your collaboration. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <you're tonight>. uh, <laughs> you know, I, uh, if I would like to chime in on that a little bit. Uh, you know, working from home, we, we've really had to learn, learn a new way of working and, and, and connecting with each other. Um, fortunately, the online tools have gotten a lot better. Uh, we use something that's Slack like. Not exactly Slack, but uh, you know you need to get used to those new tools. And um, I think back when I was in the office, you know, I would like to maybe just wander around the building for a little while. You know, have these accidental uh, hallway conversations with people, coffee cooler, coffee station type of conversations. Uh, I'll say I miss those. To to recreate that today, we have to be very intentional about it, and we actually schedule, you know, like water cooler time if you will um where we just sort of have a chance to talk and talk about whatever it's not really a set agenda we just we just talk um so that that is one of the challenges um but you know another thing i try to do too based on some reading or studies i heard is kind of putting your work during the certain kinds of work during certain during certain times of the day so mm -hmm. in the morning when you're maybe the most fresh, you have the most energy, you, you're highly caffeinated from your coffee. <laughs> you know, that's when you kind of do a lot of the really focused kind of work. Um, then following lunch, after you've maybe wanting a little siesta or something, maybe you're a little low in energy, um, try and do those sort of administrative tasks like you know, updating your time card or... Uh, uh, submitting that expense report, those sort of uh, routine sort of things that don't necessarily take a lot of brain energy to get them done, but they need to get done. And then toward the end of the day, you know, after you've been working all day, you want to relax a little bit. That's usually when I do the real creative kind of work, um, hmm. the sort of pie in the sky you know, I'm going to open up a session of SolidWorks and just start modeling on some concept that I've been having in the back of my mind and, and never got around to. Um, you know, it's that that's kind of how I sometimes will, will structure my day to try and, you know, make the best use of my energy levels during the day for doing that kind of work. Interesting. And Joe, how about uh, tracking these projects? How has that changed for you? Uh, yeah, it has changed in a number of ways. Before, I used to like to be able to wander down to each each discipline and, and you know, take the temperature, how things are going. Um, obviously, the best way to get the project information is by the water cooler, like uh, Tom said. You know, that's where you're going to find out, ooh, this is slipping and that's slipping. Um, we still uh, use a, a scrum process. Um, we're agile based in most of our development work. So we still have that interaction during the day um, where I can find out things. Um, but now it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit more scheduled on me talking to someone. So you schedule some feedback time where we can go over how the problem's going um, or, or the project's going, what can we do to help things out? So there's a little bit change in the fact that it's not a wander around uh, and find out how things are going. It still is capturing the scrum. I consider that very important uh, to start the day off. 
everybody knows what they're doing and, and what, what their work product is gonna help in the end. Um, I did wanna circle back to one thing that Chuck said. Um, mm -hmm. you know, as you're taking the temperature of the group, and obviously it's a little harder uh, to take the temperature of the group, the team, uh, you know, remotely. But but you, as you pick up on the cues, something Chuck said reminded me that it, you should always plan for an easy win for the team at some point. Um, you know, you need to con continuously make sure the confidence is there. Um, so the, you got to make sure that they know that they're working hard. But hey, look, we just solved this. Sometimes they don't don't realize that they've solved the problem, or put something out there like Chuck said. You know you know they can win. I think that's important um, and even more so now with remote teams so that they feel that they're contributing and, and creating um, instead of thinking I'm making code uh, in my basement at night for someone. It's okay, my product is helping. Uh, and, and the more wins, the more confidence the team gets, um, I find the more, more willing or more uh, innovative, I would say, word it that way they, they tend to be they, they become more mm -hmm. more solution driven yeah interesting so going forward just looking at uh at building out adding people to the team i'm curious what what do you folks look for in a good uh engineering candidate what's a good background what should their interest be what should their what what kind of personality do you look for uh, i don't know if chuck if you want to leave that one off or Oh, you're muted again, Chuck. Yeah. There you go. This one is interesting because uh, I, I, I'm compelled to go both ways uh, <laughs> for this. I think that um, there, there's a, a fellow at my office who's a mechanical engineer uh, who you know works on his car. And it's like, well, okay, a mechanical engineer who works on his car. That doesn't sound very surprising. Then, well, you find out he has a machine shop in his car and uh, he has uh, in his garage. And that he will take take apart his engine, pull out a particular component, change the bore by two thousandths of an inch, send it out, uh, send it out for a specialized coating, and then reassemble it to get something like one point two percent more horsepower out of the engine. Um, and so th this is this is the deep. This is someone who is like really driven down deep into into their discipline. And so I, I'm not going to expect this person to have you know a, a compelling argument uh, uh, about firmware. You know, uh, I, I'm not going to expect them to step up in front of a customer and 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 have you know ideas on. Um, you know, on industrial design, but you know, by God, when when I have to d d uh, design and a, you know a, uh, a a lens barrel for a precision piece uh, of optical equipment, I'm going to go knock on his door and have him take a look at it. So that's kind mm -hmm. of the first thing is someone who really goes deep. Uh, and then uh, the there's another fellow at my office who kind of goes the opposite direction to a certain extent. Uh, his his name's Dylan. And I was introduced to him as, as a machinist. Um, it just so happens that he is taking C++ classes at night. Um, he taught me how to program an Arduino to control uh, color programmable LED strips. He is a beekeeper. He recently electrified his fence because uh, to fend off bears. He uh, also <laughs> is a brewer. And um, he is a, an ongoing judge at the uh, the first robotics competition uh, Lego division. And so Dylan, if he doesn't already know how to do something, he is absolutely going to be interested in learning how to do it. Uh, and, and that having having someone like that, uh, he has boundless enthusiasm and and curiosity. And you know the creativity is you know just one you know one step behind that. So that that's uh, so the deep or the broad, and um, I think someone who's willing to admit they they uh, there's something they don't know is one of the I think one of the the worst things in terms of you know collaboration is you end up in a situation where someone gets to sign something and they go off. In, into the weeds, and you know, weeks later, you find out they're not able to hold up their end. Uh, so, so someone who someone who's uh, the humble in that regard as well. 
That, that's great. We'll, we'll get into a few of the audience questions in a moment, but Joe, do you want to uh, amplify that or add anything? Um, I would say that Chuck's right there. Uh, he, he hit both things. It really depends on the role you're looking for, but, but more importantly, you're looking at the person as a whole. Um, you know, it's not just their ability to calculate a formula or come up with a solution. You're looking at their, their outlook. Um, you, you want somebody that, that's willing to try. Uh, you want somebody that's willing to admit, hey, I'm going to make a mistake, you know. And that's, that's important because uh, in development uh, and in the, in the world we play in, we do make mistakes, and that's how we learn. So we, we can't be afraid um, to try things. So that, that I consider also an important trait. But other than that, you know, it really it really is the mix of, of those talents that make the person and whether they're going to fit with your team and, and who you know you have existing on that team. So it, it really mm -hmm. comes down to to, the, to those uh, factors. Terrific, Tom. Anything to add to, to just what makes uh, but makeup of uh, of colleagues, I suppose, or if you're looking to to bring so, someone onto your team? Well, sure. I mean. So being born and raised in Southern California, um, I'm used to a lot of diversity in my experience. And I actually look for a lot of diversity in the team. And, and, that, and that, in every sense of the word, uh, I think, you know, looking at the traditional terms of diversity, such as, you know, race, gender, ethnicity, I think everyone there brings something interesting to the conversation. And then also the diversity of experience and thought, um, is also key, uh, different uh, diversity of, of disciplines as well. Like I said, I, I rarely worked on anything that was purely mechanical. I always need to know a little bit of the, all the different uh, uh, disciplines, engineering disciplines that are out there. Uh, we truly operate in a global environment, at least I know I do at Boston Scientific. Uh, and so you really have to have a very global approach to to you know, how you design and, and how you try to solve solutions. So it's really hard to bring such a diverse group of people together. But if I can, then that's certainly something that I'm looking for in my team. That's a great point. And that's something that's been brought up too, whether it's been brought up as to what, what impact diversity has can have on the collaborative effort on and on the design effort. And, uh, it's uh, it's finally getting I think the attention that that it deserves. You're you're absolutely right. Uh, we've got a. Did anyone else want to follow up on that? I thought I don't know if I heard someone else talk. No, I I think that no. I really like Tom's insight uh, and you know there. I forget that I at one point worked at a very 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 large multinational company. Uh, and there were were some people there who were kind of. Uh, clock punchers it's like they'd show up show up at nine o'clock they take an hour for lunch and they leave at five o'clock they've been doing the same thing for the last 20 years uh and uh they and they might even be good at it but but i think that that having people who are having some people who are new having some people who are old and experienced having people from different you know different industries uh, i i think that that's something that is really going to to help an organization have creativity mm -hmm. i think tom, tom has really good points yeah absolutely i think that that's key i think uh, it really does bring a new set of eyes to solutions um that we need um and it makes for a better team balance it makes for a better exchange um uh, i think i think that tom hit on a, on a really good point there um, is that something you look for are you involved in the assembly of the team joe do you sort of pick team members or is that predetermined for you uh no it, it, so we do discuss it um you know uh, yeah. because certain certain problem sets or certain groups that are, or clients we're working with, you know, they're expecting somebody that may be high, high and detailed for documentation uh, and others are looking to run really quickly. And maybe we don't need a document right now. We just need the, you know, some, something made. So you, you try to balance out a team with, with people's skills. You know, you don't want to put somebody in a position where they like to overanalyze things. Uh, and put them on something that really has to run quickly. Uh, so you do take a look at their skills, you know, and how they how they like to operate. Um, and then you have to balance it out. And it gets back to what Chuck was saying earlier. It comes to that Venn diagram that, that you have for mm -hmm. a team. 
component, you want to make sure you're covering everything there. So, so yeah, it, it definitely is taken into consideration um, uh, when you're when you're constructing that team, particularly for what you're working on. Terrific. So we'll, we'll have some questions from from the audience. There's a few posted if folks have uh, some more. I think we we probably have some time to take them. So a question from Ron is when developing a new medical device product, how do you ensure designs are best practice processes at the component level are being considered as they relate to best cost, performance, tolerance, and capacity? And it said this this should be based on annual usage of the device. So I don't know if you folks can see that question, if you have uh, any thoughts on it. Uh, okay, that, that, that's great. It seems, seems peel that onion and and uh, I'll, I'll follow up if if i miss anything I and mean, this goes back to uh kind of the the formal you know the the v diagram process that joe was talking about earlier which is you know you're you really are going to need to start with a solid system system level requirements document uh you, you really need to to nail down what it is you're shooting for and from there each you know you'll get a, a set of mechanical require you know you'll, you'll you'll break that off into mechanical software electrical requirements you take the those mechanical requirements you you know that you have formal inputs you then do the design process saying that well if if these are the numbers that i have to you know have to come out of the machine here is here is my analysis that shows this kind of device will deliver that uh and then you build the thing and test the thing um and I think that I touched on this a, a little bit before uh, when I was talking about the doing the sensitivity component for an analysis. So as things vary, um, as inputs to the the manufactured device vary, you know the diameters on the needle vary a little bit. What effect is that going to have on what you know kind of the level of pain that someone feels? Um, mm -hmm. I'm a little unclear about how the 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 manufactured quantity plays into this. Are we drifting more into kind of uh, operations and IP I, IQ OQ PQ kind of qualification of the of equipment used in the manufacturing process? Is that what he wants? Yeah, to I'm, speak I'm sorry, to? I don't. Yeah, I'm not yeah. quite sure. So. I think uh, unless anyone else has some thoughts, uh, we can move on to another one. Tom, any? Did, were you speaking up? Did I well, talk over you? Yeah, you know, one of the this is kind of related, to maybe a little off topic, but one of the you know one of the problems I, I uh, one of the challenges I think I have you know in my career is trying to stay up on top of what are the latest um, manufacturing processes and capabilities um, and materials and such that are out there. How do I stay current? Um, here in Southern California, we had a show every year, a huge show, the medical device and manufacturing md &M show. That was actually like five different shows in one that covers <clears throat> soup to nuts. Uh, you could barely walk the whole show in a, in, in a day. It usually takes two or three days. So I would try to get there and, and just try and absorb as much as I can and try and find new suppliers and new tech that are out there and try and compare, all right, this is what these people are doing or are our suppliers you know, doing the same thing that these people are, are they as good as they could be, or should we, you know, invite them in and try and learn something new? So that's one thing I do. Um, and then from a very specific design standpoint, I, I spend a lot of attention paying atten uh, to uh, capability studies. Um, I put a lot of stock into capability studies, trying to make sure that the design that I've created enables the process to make the part within spec all the time that makes sense. In other words, getting high PPKs, CPKs. Um, if the process isn't capable of doing that, then it's like, all right, either the design's wrong or we need a new process, you know, and then we start looking around. So I hope that answered the question properly. It's a good, good, good effort. Joey, anything to, to add to that or, or should we move yeah, on? No, I, um, yeah, I'm a strong believer in, in the use of tools, particularly for DFM, um, but process capability studies, um, you know, CPK, uh, CPP, um, strong believer in that, you know, early and often testing, I think is really, really important and, and reliability testing now. So I'm not sure if the question was really going towards, you know, are we making sure that the manufacturer has the newest and best 
capabilities, um, you know, and, and the tolerance and capacity, you know, for their pick and place. Um, are we asking for a board that's a little too tight for that? Uh, but we do keep up with our, our suppliers uh, and our partners on their capabilities um, in making sure that we're designing with that within that uh, a band. Um, but to Tom's point, I think it's it's incumbent on us as designers and developers to test and make sure that that AR design meets meets what we're asking for it to meet, and then it's manufactured in a process that that'll uh, conform uh, deliver that that uh, consistently. How are, final question? We'll uh, we'll just wrap it up sort of going forward. How are you uh, planning to sort of ensure that the, the creative process remains strong uh, in in this COVID era. I know you folks have added uh, some space to your, your spot up in Bedford. I think you've got some outdoor space where people can congregate. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you anticipate going back to work any differently than you did in, in, in a way that has some, some permanence? Do you see some, some practices that you've adopted in, in this time that you're going to carry forward because uh, they either have to or you just find out it works better? Joe, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, no, I, th I think we've learned a lot on um, uh, a result of, the, of COVID and the pandemic. Um, you know, some things good, some things bad, but we had learned, you know, that the flexibility is key uh, in people's lives, that it's it's important to, to be able to offer them the, the work from home option. Um, yeah. Also, the personal safety, you know, if, if they're not comfortable coming in, uh, they shouldn't have to. Uh, so I think those those rules are, are going to be continued to, to be adopted. But I think I think uh, helping people separate and, and and make sure that they have the safety they need is important. But I think the working from home is I see that as continuing uh, continuing, and, and I think it's a, a great aspect um, for people. I think right now uh, and, and in the future, it allows allows people to to be more flexible with their with their life and and the, those about them uh, around them. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Chuck, how about uh, from your perspective, and, and what are you doing to sort of uh, spark creativity outside of uh, work collaboration? I, I think you had mentioned your one of the a podcast that's a favorite of mine as well. That uh, something you oh, enjoy? Uh, okay, yeah. So, so th this this is like kind of one of the things I, I think that um, speaks to getting past a, a creative block. There's a, a podcast called Ninety Nine Percent Invisible. Um, which spans everything from architecture to clothing design to medical devices. It's uh, and it it just does all of these stunning little mini explorations into kind of why the the design world is the way it is. And so I, I think I, I really enjoy that. Um, I'm gonna throw up as we're wrapping up here. I just wanted to mention another software tool, Miro M I R O dot com. Uh, is a shared whiteboard where multiple people can go and simultaneously sketch, which has been very helpful for uh, a couple of uh, mechanical brainstorming sessions, um, especially if you just grab yourself a digitizer and a stylus. Uh, I'm not very good at drawing with a mouse, and so for rapid sketching, I think that that's, that's a very useful tool. Uh, and, and something that's perhaps a little a little pedantic, um, but I think is is crucial uh, with with all of this remote working that we're doing, is if your company doesn't already have PDM software uh, for CAD tools, uh, you're going to want to invest in that. It just makes sure that when you have a team working on something complex, that you know no one edits something that someone else is intending to edit. Uh, and completely unrelated to anything, I did want to mention that around 20 years ago, Tom Lopez, uh, Thomas Lopez and I had this, this, ra uh, this random discussion about Pacific Northwest Native American uh, mythology. And uh, two months later, this showed up on my doorstep that... Tom has had had made so uh, you, when you're interviewing engineers and you want to make sure that they're creative, you might hand them a pile of clay and paint and say, "Make me a thunderbird," and, and see if they step up to the plate or not. <laughs> Tom, any, uh, any comment, well Tom? <laughs> I want that back. <laughs> <laughs> he was just lending it to you. Right. That's great. And it, all right. Anything to add to that, Tom? Any, any uh, 
any any lessons learned from COVID that you'll be taking forward with you? Uh, well, I, I, you know, as, as bad as it is, I think it's kind of given us a chance to see what's possible um, with with flexible time and and um, with online tools to to allow people to be a little more flexible with their time. Uh, but it's also been challenging learning those tools and trying to develop new ways of kind of doing what we've done. I'll be honest, it, since since COVID, I've, uh, uh, I've been on this project where my nose has been to the grindstone the whole time. So I really haven't had the chance to really do some of these really creative ideas and then just really make use of those tools. But I am seeing that you know, some of these online tools, such as Slack and Zoom and others, they're they're starting to improve, and I hope that they continue to improve because the demand is so high for for better tools, and they're introducing new things that I'm starting to learn, and and other people are starting to learn like, oh, you could do that. I didn't know that was possible, and started using them now, and so I think some of that's going to help as well. Um, people just need to get used to change. Um, which is, is it's a hard thing to do, you know. Um, um, what what's working now, three months from now, is going to be different, and so it, it's coming fast. Um, and so people, that's just making people comfortable and ready for it. You know, is going to be what you need to do. Absolutely. Well, this, this, these some of these virtual discussions are, are an offshoot of, of that as well. But uh, hopefully, we'll uh, keep these going, but also bring back some in person events that we can all gather at. So uh, I think that's a, a great time to, to wrap it up. I'd like to thank you, gentlemen, for uh, for your time and uh, your insights. It's been a, a lot of fun as I anticipated. Uh, thank you to uh, Sunrise Labs for uh, for making this possible and for sponsoring this. And of course, thank you to everyone who attended and for joining us on uh, on Device Talks Tuesdays. And we'll have another one coming up uh, in two weeks. We're not going to do one next week. Uh, we had one scheduled, but it just wasn't able to come together. And uh, it is an election day, so I think people will have their minds elsewhere. Uh, so uh, please do remember to vote and uh, tune in in two weeks. We'll have another Device Talks Tuesday for you. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Go Dodgers. <laughs>